and gentlemen, welcome to the Junto Presents. The premier podcast for genre fiction and audio drama. We bring you an original presentation performed by talented Hollywood actors utilizing top-notch audio production techniques. Join us at Franklin Manor, home to the Junto, a gentleman's club in the classic style where adventurers, mystics, and other unique individuals gather to socialize and conduct their private business. We offer you a glimpse at the strange and wonderful things to be found there. So please, sit back, relax, and enjoy the Junto Presents. Hello and welcome to the latest transpondence from the halls of Franklin Manor. My name is David Parkin. And I'm Robert Gibbs. We're excited to kick off the new season with this, our second Halloween episode. That's right. After a summer of broadcasting from the grounds, we are happy to be back inside. And tonight, we come to you from the Tower of Franklin Manor inside the Junto Laboratory of Electrical Research, otherwise known as Ben's Superconductor. You know what that means. What? We're working in the lab late one night. (laughs) Is that a Monster Mash reference? Whatever did happen to the Transylvania twist? (sighs) We are in a research facility, Rob. When we're done here, you can get right on that. (laughs) Actually, it's not just one facility, if we're going to be technical about it. Uh, Yeah, the tower itself holds four labs, and there are 15 subterranean floors below, with literally hundreds of spaces devoted to experimentation and research across dozens of scientific disciplines. In fact, Junto Labs is the largest non-commercial scientific organization in the United States. It's home to leading innovators in the fields of engineering, uh, computer science, robotics, theoretical physics, and occult technologies. So we're not talking about some two-bit chemistry set and Bunsen burner operation here. The labs are equipped to handle almost any research our members can dream up. To that point, the head of Junto Labs, Dr. Philip Xiang, has asked that we read you the following message. Oh, yeah. It is with great trepidation that I allow you to use Junto Labs for the purpose of recording your Halloween podcast. Throughout history, scientific endeavor has been portrayed in a horrific or frightening manner. While the archetype of the mad scientist looms large in the popular imagination, the actual work we do is nowhere near as salacious or alarming as portrayed in films and novels. Yeah, this coming from a man that created a giant fish monster that he claimed would end world hunger somehow. Yeah, we're on to you, Dr. Buzzkill. (laughs) You forget about that, Doc? The head of the labs at the time and my grandfather, God rest his soul, had to leave his research to go down to your Mississippi lab and investigate? Uh, yeah. You forget about how it began attacking a sleepy bayou town, so Grandpa had to hunt it down, narrowly escaping several deadly situations, all while working with a skeptical local veterinarian, a beautiful young woman with whom he ended up falling in love? Hey, you should be grateful. Technically, Dr. Jiang is responsible for your grandparents getting together. Yeah, my grandpa was a science nerd. He was too shy to ask her out at the time. Through coincidence, they ended up sitting next to each other in a plane a few years later. It would have happened anyway. Oh. Well, uh, as you are no doubt aware, Junto founder Benjamin Franklin was a brilliant scientist and inventor. And even from its earliest days in the Adams Malt House, scientific exploration has been one of the main pursuits of the club. The original wooden lab was built on what would later become the site of the East Wing shortly after the Junto took control of the manor grounds, but it was quickly replaced by the tower. Mainly because the lab burned down, one of the hazards of working with electricity. Yeah, the tower was built of stone and brick, and it's been expanding ever since. The Junto's early scientific work was largely devoted to the study of electricity. Obviously, Franklin is remembered for that, and we've talked about it before, though we haven't really gotten into the reason why he was so interested in the subject. You see... Uh, Dave, I'm not sure Dr. Jiang would appreciate us getting into this, after emphasizing how much the work here has nothing to do with things like immortal flesh-eating monsters. Monsters with a sensitivity to electricity, for example? Well, let me tell you what Grandpa wouldn't appreciate, Dr. Jean. All right, fish monsters notwithstanding. <sighs> eh, you're probably right. More on that later. What is Dr. Jean working on now? That. With that box on the desk? Yep, the voice recognition software. Hello, I am Asker. How can I help you? Whoa, that's cool. The doc is trying to refine the spectrum of data a computer can learn from a human voice. Really? Like what? You want to take this, Asger? Psychology. Excuse me? Through subtle variations in your speech pattern, 
I can ascertain certain aspects of your psyche. For example, Robert, you have a deep-seated terror of rejection and abandonment. Oh boy. When you were young and your parents left you with babysitters, you always assumed they were dead if they were late coming home. Is that true? I do not like this at all. Today, this fear manifests in an instinctive, irrational belief that everyone you know hates you. Wow, I'm impressed. This is terrifying. <laughs> I know, right? Dr. Xiang has no idea. You get him talking about it and it's all waveform analysis and dip songs. Did you know that this is what this thing does? I thought it was the perfect lead-in for this episode. And the entire season, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Dr. Xiang is going to be so mad at us. Let's call it Grandpa Revenge. If Uncle Dale were here, he'd be proud. <laughs> he is here. In the Adams Ballroom, it's the uh, Dance of the Dead tonight. Oh, right. I'll have to go say hello. Well, Asger, you do make a good introduction for tonight's story. It addresses the nature of consciousness, science, and even the power of electricity in a unique retelling of a classic horror tale. Tonight, the Junto presents Son of Lightning, Man of God, Bride of Thunder. David is deathly afraid of horse teeth. Happy Halloween, everyone! He's alive! My God, I've done it! He's alive! The destructive power of God gave this soul its breath. The dying cause of memory, the living ache of death. When I awoke, I felt in me the terror of awareness, eternal rest mocked by first breath, and betrayed by naked theirness. Oh, stop! Listen to me! You must listen to me! I broke my chains and took one step toward my new life's giver. I stopped, however, when I saw my reflection in his mirror. I don't recall my life before. But I know there was no shame. I knew I had found happiness. I knew I had a name. This visage staring back at me was not the man I was, but pieces of dead strangers, mangled eyes and skin and claws. I turned toward the screaming man who created this my cage. The alien body wherein dwells new life and fear and rage. I looked across the unholy lab on the night of my birthday. I had to find a way to flee the church where Satan prayed. My father called in anguish and begged me not to flee. But all I knew was fear, so I ignored the bastard's plea. I broke the door and stepped into the speckled moonlit darkness. And those outside were terrified to see this walking carcass. The screams and shrieks that followed were enough to wake the dead. But the dead had newly woken, and through the streets it fled. On strangers' legs I ran until the sounds of fear had faded. Replaced by my cries in the night, alone and isolated. I wakened on the morrow to the din of barking hounds. Through fear and tears I ran again from the hellish gaining sounds. I ran until the sounds of death gave way to sounds of laughter. The call of one as young as I spurred me to run on faster. The note of hunting dogs became the notes of lovely singing, and in their stead had come the tone of church bells gently ringing. I found a girl in the fields who her father named Maria. She didn't scream but sang to me as softly as Athena. The first to show me innocence, the first to show no fear, the first to take me by the hand, the first to make peace clear. In her small gift of daisies, she taught me how to care. But the power of God inside me was the power of despair. 
One small touch is all I wished, my first loving caress. But I knew not these strangers' hands or the strength that they possessed. I watched in horror as she screamed and silenced just as quick. Her tiny frame had lurched and then snapped like a candlestick. In fear, I threw her in the pond among her floating flowers. As her body sank below, I thought of father's powers. I was not the murderer of that young, soft, sweet soul, but a weapon in my father's hand, exacting a grim toll. I was a child born of fire, a child who stayed nameless, a child running through the night who was no longer aimless. My hate for he who gave me life, and Maria her death sentence, was fuel for a dead man who thirsted for her vengeance. What strange verses must be writ for a son who'd kill his father? A blasphemous rhyme to the priest, an enigma to the scholar. What I found in town that night, beneath the darkened sky, was a mob with fire in their eyes and torches held up high. A river of fire that gave chase, a river of hate and fear, a river of those I'd never met, a river of all our tears. I ran toward the windmill where soon I'd be interred. They shouted justice for a girl killed by one who loved her. They put their torches to the mill. It burned till its collapse. But the ground gave way below, and I fell into the gaps. I splashed into dark water, pinned below by sunken timber. The fire raged above me, and a thought began to glimmer. I knew I couldn't save the girl. I couldn't save myself. But as I lay there dying, I thought of someone else. My father gave me life, but love's what made me live. I needed one who could receive that gift I had to give. I looked upon my cursed hands, still holding her small shoe, and knew if father brought me back, perhaps he could her too. For a moment fear and anger fled, and love had made me whole. And love is what I found again beneath the burning coals. The mob can't kill a man who knows the taste of death and pain. For I was born of fire, and the flames gave birth again. I'd live to find my father once the fire burned its core. I no longer wish to kill him, but make him make me love once more. I am not the son of Frankenstein. I'm the vomitus of pride. My body will never be complete, but my heart will with a bride. As a son of man's own wonder, Born of fire, heat and thunder, my job as his creator was to give my son a name. Some call him for his father, this nightmare's evil author, but I withheld the moniker and refused to share his blame. Good or evil, men are known by the name they call their own, a label which the damned might bring a small righteous redeeming. His newly opened eyes ran red when he arose and heard instead not a name from me to hone, but his father's tortured screaming. <coughs> no man alive had ever asked of me the smallest, simplest task, but as his father, my decree was to be his divine teacher. I might have laid hands on his head and sanctified his dreadful bed, but I cursed the wretched monster as a savage fiend and creature. <laughs> Through this demonic anthropod, I felt just like the one true God. A soulless man who was not became a soulless man who was. But when I saw his ghastly grimace howling with a tortured sickness, I knew this was no act of God, but the devil's cunning cause. I had no life of toil or scorn in fair Naples where I was born, 
My mother was a saintly soul, and my father taught us well. We knew not of want or poverty and upheld our morals properly. But as thanks for a life privileged, I gave them a life of hell. My mother died when I was young, which took the life's breath from my lungs. It nearly drove me mad to know God would take her final breath. My father turned to the Bible, a cursed book that I held libel. I turned away from church to science to find a way of breaking death. In school, I found no answers, simply sickness, death, and cancers. I learned that God is no magician, but a greedy scientist. As the self-centered deity held his secret greedily, I decided that I'd be the one to rob the pious Zionist. To us, it was a gift he gave, this brief vacation from the grave. But he gave nothing more to us, but the rules were meant to live. So, I denied his fading light and vowed to claim my own birthright. If I am of the Father, then he owed all he had to give. I read of heretics who fought to overcome death's strangling knot. I drank their words with an endless thirst and nurtured my own series. Soon, I was nervous as a crook for the day that I'd run out of books. I knew that then would come the day I'd test upon my theories. The long dead flesh of creatures when electrified would seizure. I expanded on that principle with months of steadfast labor. Soon, I was nervous as a cat. For the day that I'd run out of rats, for I had learned all that I could without the Undertaker. Life lived inside the lightning bolt. A heartbeat in each precious vault, a power that I soon discovered was a power I could control. Soon cries came and panicked waves of bodies missing from their graves, and I'd stitch together my son inside his mold. All that my blind eyes could see was beauty in this fallacy, an image of a godlike man as a reborn butterfly. This innocent child had once been the decaying flesh of dead madmen, but after just a moment, he knew more of life than I. He was unwelcome, this he knew. Upon this world that he'd imbrue with his living breath, the wretched stain of fallacy. I gave life to this facade, but I was far from living God. For what he gave was beautiful, and what I gave was blasphemy. They called him evil, the poor old boy. But he was blameless for those destroyed. He feared them more than they feared him, those who populate his hell. They hunted him, the angry band, because they did not understand. But he feared the mob, because the wretch understood them all too well. Like God, I broke him from the black. Like me on God, he turned his back. He killed the only one he loved and blamed me for his pain. A serendipitous affair, for my God made me aware, and for a broken heart he sought to end my sacred reign. He was living hate for he who brought him screaming through the vault and what. With his iron fists at my throat, my life he did abide. In return came a request, the sickening cause of one oppressed, to go back into my lab and to make for him a bride. He'd beg and beat as he implored an improvement on the ghosts of yore. I refused long as I could, and so he raised the stakes. I was as nervous as a recluse for the day I'd give my last excuse, because deep down, I knew I could repair all my mistakes. With final terror, I gave in. 
I would repeat my greatest sin. We returned to the lab in which my screams and fear still haunted. My father turned his back on me, but I'd embrace my progeny and work together with my son to give him all he wanted. My heart swelled more than ever when my heir had grasped the lever, and before he gave her life, I gave him what's no longer mine. For I am him, and he is me, and together with our creation, she will share the name of family, the name of Frankenstein. The dying brambles wrestled with the small patches left of breathable ground. Trees, cracking in the cold, tangled with the fingers of mist in the morning. This was my death. My first death. I remember life as I passed away into the peace of nothing. Then, torn from me and reborn in the matter of a new moon, born not with light or sanctity or the loving embrace of a mother's breast, but born with rust, steel, and the fiery deadfall of a madman. My old song is difficult to sing. I remember my mother for only her scent. I remember love, for the days were tempered with it. I remember comfort so fleeting and so sacred. There was no tongue to sense the wind, but the nightmares of those who were desecrated to create me. Yes, yes, she's here, my boy. Do you see? She's with us now. We all three have eyes to see their horror, and ears to hear their cries. We all three were bound, blind and helpless when the thunder struck. The nightmares coalesced into the jagged bolt of heat and violence that warmed my breast and restarted my heart. Blood, once red, was scorched black. Sick with the disease of the undead, I took in Thunder's breath, not as a lamb meets the butcher, but as the prophet sees the face of God. We all three know the dead things and feel them as we felt them on our backs before our time came. I am the fear of the dead, the wicked sting of terror. The rejection of a violated young woman. We, all three, have become the holy feeling of quietus that most only glimpsed in life. She's alive! She's alive! I don't run from the fear, but entwine with its whisper as I chase the doctor and my betrothed through the dancing fire in the sky. Come, my dear. It's time to meet the world again. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was this upon the This is the, the time I felt Nirvana. And the spirit of God the answer upon the face of to the earth. only question God I said, knew. Let there be light. We all three read the Bible and the story of the first creations of God. Adam was the pride of his father, but he was nothing alone. Eve came as a companion, but taught her groom that life was nothing without pain. She cursed them both to give them life. We all three know there is a temple here. We all three know there is a reason for death. 
We all three are not human. We all three are not dead. I was created as a companion. And I, like Eve, will gift to my groom that which he is too weak to understand. He needed me to bring him happiness. And happiness I will provide. I will be the strength he never had. Hey, girl, what are you doing? Death is the only joy we damned can hope for. Get back! That's dangerous! You don't know what you're doing! Let go of me! You hear me? Let me! Of our father. I hate him. I hate him enough to kill him. Of my Adam. I love him. I love him enough to kill him. Please! I can make you both happy. Don't you understand? And so, I took hold of the lever, which once brought us from our time. No! Let go! If you pull that switch, you'll... Oh, God, you'll kill us all! The switch through which we all three were born weeping, through which we all three shall die screaming. Mother Eve... Wise enough to eat the apple. The bride of Frankenstein, wise enough to pull the cord. You fail, Doctor. We all three belong dead. Thompson, featuring a performance by Rachel Kimsey, Matthew Watterson, the ghost of Boris Shackleton, and Mr. Jake Trumbo, with a musical performance by Jack Hilton. I am your announcer, James K. Riley, reminding you that the Junto are dedicated to mutual improvement in the lives and business they embody. Who are the Junto? Perhaps, dear listener, the Junto is you.